welcome you back to this, this series called The Day of the Lord. Today in chapter 6, we will be studying the book of life in the first three seals on it. This will be an exciting study, and I pray that you'll get a real blessing from this study. After we complete this uh, latest video, we're going to be going right into the Great Tribulation, and we've broken that down into 10 steps. So you can see here what the 10 steps are. So these will be the upcoming videos uh, in the next weeks and months. So what are the seven seals? Well, I believe the seven seals on the Book of Life represent a seven-step process that will, at the end of a thousand years, at the end of the millennium, it will reveal everything about the love and the full identity, the full Godship of Jesus Christ. So keep that in mind as we go through the study today. So what are the first three seals? Well, the first one has to do with a white horse. The second one has to do with a red horse, a rider on a red horse. And the third one has to do with a rider on a black horse. I believe all three of these seals have already been opened. And here are the dates. I'll give you the answer right at the beginning here. I believe this first seal was opened in 1798. The second seal was opened in 1800. And the third seal was opened in 1844. So you're probably interested where I got these dates. So why don't we go ahead and get into it and uh, you can take a look at it and see what you think. First though, I want to explain a concept to you that's been a real help to me. And this concept is called the Earth Heaven Linkage. And this concept I've used, I learned it a few years ago, and it has helped me really understand these seals. So there is a uh, something here I'm going to show you where we can link activities in heaven to activities on earth for a few of these seals. So this is my great illustration here of the heaven and earth. A little photo here with a little black line between it. So this is going to represent heaven. This is a God's heaven, not the earthly heaven. And this is Earth with its rocks and uh, the terrain here, etc. So my question is this. If we're reading a prophecy about the end times, and it's describing a heavenly event, how can we know the date of that event? That would be handy. If we're describing a heavenly event, how can we know what that date is when that occurred? So what I think would be nice if we could relate that heavenly event to a date of an earthly event that we know about with, you know, good certainty. So let's see if, uh, if we can do this. And, and I believe we can, at least for the first three seals. So we're going to go to the book of Daniel. And here we, we read that Daniel had a dream. And this dream was a vision. And so Daniel looked and he saw that thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took its seat. And the court was seated and the books were open. So this sounds to me like this is a courtroom scene. So the courtroom was set up. The judge was seated. That's God the Father here. And the books were open. Now we'll be looking at these books quite a bit as we go along today. So this is the first uh, text I want to bring to you. Now we read further where Daniel says, I looked and there before me was one like a son of God, which is Jesus, coming with the clouds of heaven. These clouds of heaven, that's probably his entourage of heavenly angels. It looked like clouds to uh, John. And he approached the ancient of days, God the Father, and Jesus was given something. He approached God the Father, and God the Father gave him something. He gave him authority, 
glory, and sovereign power. Evidently, he did not have that. Otherwise, why would he have had it given to him? So God the Father gave him authority, glory, and sovereign power. So this sure sounds to me like this was an important meeting, wasn't it? So Jesus arrives, and he, he's given sovereign uh, power. Then something else is written here. It says, The horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Now we know that horns don't have eyes, and horns don't speak. So this horn must be a symbolic reference to something, something else. But anyway, we read that this horn that had eyes and a mouth and spoke boastfully, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them. So this horn was defeating God's people until, until something, this is a real key word, until God the Father, the Ancient of Days, came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people. So God the Father pronounced judgment, a, a restraining order, if you will. He issued a judgment, stop the war, stop defeating his people. Stop defeating them. So this sounds pretty important too, doesn't it? So, a little recap here. The heavenly court was seated and the books were opened. God the Father was there. Jesus arrived on a cloud, probably his angels were with him. And Jesus was given sovereign authority. That's a pretty big deal. And God the Father pronounced judgments, a judgment in favor of the saints. So my question is this, is there a date of a, an event on earth that we can use to align with this heavenly event? And I believe there is. I believe that this prophecy describes the martyrdom of the saints during the dark ages by the Catholic Church. There's some estimates of uh, between 50 and 100 million uh, uh, people were martyred during this dark ages. That's a lot of people. So this ended though, when the Pope at the time was taken captive in 1798. So this event here, I believe, started in 1798. That's when the Pope was taken uh, captive and the martyrdom stopped. So this is what I'm calling the earth-heaven linkage. We can link a heavenly event with a known earth event and we come up with a date. So we'll be using this for the first three seals here in the next few minutes. The other thing I want to review with you quickly is a short recap of the study entitled War that I've uh, already released, and this will help our understanding of the seals. So there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, or the devil, or Lucifer, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But they were not strong enough, and so they lost their place in heaven. They were kicked out of heaven. So this war that started in heaven is now on earth. And it's still going on this day. So what are God's strategic objectives in this war? Well, these are what I think they are. Number one is to eliminate sin from the universe now, immediately today when, when this war finishes but also for all of eternity. And number two, God wants to save as many people on earth who are willing to accept Jesus' generous offer of eternal life. So he wants to save as many people as will be saved. So these are God's two strategic objectives, I believe. Well, has God planned strategic campaigns to achieve his objectives? And I believe yes. 
And I believe these are the seven seals. These are seven campaigns, you could think of them, on the book of life that Jesus and God will use to reach his objectives. Now, as a reminder, in eternity past, God the Father looked through the annals of time and he realized that God, that sin would raise its ugly head. So he had a plan. He put together a plan and he wrote it and sealed it within this book, the Book of Life. So the Book of Life is sealed with seven seals and these seals will be opened during this great tribulation. The first three have already been opened and the next four will be opened in the future. And each one of the seals on the Book of Life is a strategic campaign to achieve God's objectives. So this was written in the past. He sealed it with seven seals and it's still sealed to this day. Yes, there are some of the seals that are open, but the book itself is not opened. So the seven seals or seven campaigns, I've given them some names here. Let's take a look at them. Number one, I'm calling the salvation of Jesus. Number two is the gospel of Jesus. Number three is the judgment of Jesus. Now these three, one, two, and three, we're going to be covering those today. Number four, five, six, and seven, uh, we'll be covering those as we cover the great tribulation. And that's the authority of Jesus, the faith of Jesus, the glory and power of Jesus, and the sovereign deity of Jesus. So these are all focused on various aspects of Jesus, all seven seals. So the Book of Life again is seven seals. Seals one, two, and three, I believe, have opened in the past. Seals four, five, and six will be opened soon as the Great Tribulation is unleashed on us. Seal number seven, I believe, will open at the end of the millennium, at the end of a thousand years, millennium. So where are we on this little picture here? Well, we're right over here in this little crack. We're between seal three, which is opened, and seal four, which is not opened. We're right here. So let's go ahead and get started, and let's take a look at these three seals. Now these seals do, do go in order. So the f first seal is open, then the second, then the third, etc. So let's look at the first seal. The first seal, again, is the rider on the white horse. This is in Revelation 6-2. And I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a victor's bow, victor's ribbon, and he was given a victor's crown and he rode out as to as a conqueror bent on conquest. So I believe that this bow is actually a winner's ribbon and I believe this crown is actually a winner's crown. So authorities of the Greek language have varying opinions about the bow. While some authorities maintain that the first horseman carried a bow, like a bow and arrow, in preparation of a battle, I believe they're totally wrong. I believe this bow is actually a winner's ribbon, that is, an ornamental bow. So the, the Greek word uh, for bow can be uh, translated either way. It could be translated as a bow and arrow, or as a winner's ribbon or ornamental bow. So I believe this first uh, bow is actually a winner's ribbon. And he was also given a Stephanophis that is a laurel or a crown of victory. 
not a diadem or crown denoting authority or dominion as artists usually depict. So this uh, crown of victory that he was given, I believe is a winner's crown of victory. So he was given a winner's ribbon and he was given a winner's crown of victory. So why in the world do I believe that? Well, Jesus was victorious at the cross. But thank be to God, he, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was victorious at the cross. In Revelation 5, verse 4 and 5, he was found worthy in this meeting, in this courtroom scene. He was found worthy. In Daniel 7, 14, he was given sovereign authority that sure sounds to me like a winner, doesn't it? Being found worthy and given sovereign authority. And the Bible even says that he was victorious at the cross. He won the victory for us. He defeated sin. He defeated death. So the first seal, I believe, was broken in 1798. And this has released the campaign to promote salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone. He won the victory for us at the cross. Faith in Jesus Christ alone. So how did I arrive at this date? Well, let's go back to our little picture here. This is where the horn was waging war against holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people. So what actually happened here? What actually happened? Well, God issued a judgment to stop the war. So let's take a look at this here in a little more detail. This until denotes a specific time when this happened. You know, you should be looking for words like this in the Bible because they're very important. They, they denote that up until this point, something was happening, and then after this point, something different was happening. So this until is a real interesting word. Well, Berthier, General Louise Berthier, was a general in France, and there was a Pope, Pius the sixth. In 1798, Berthier took this pope prisoner, thus breaking the Catholic Church's 1,260-year stranglehold over the people of Europe. And I mentioned before, stranglehold is probably too kind a word. Between 50 and 100 million people probably were killed during the Dark Ages they were uh, persecuted by the Catholic Church. So what happened? He was taken prisoner, 1798. And this, this whole saga here is very well documented in history books, so there's no disputing what happened. 1798, the Pope was taken prisoner, and the persecution of the saints that had gone on for 1,260 years stopped. So that's where we get this date, 1798. So let's look at our little sketch again. So we have years, 1600, 1718, etc. So at some point in time, there was a courtroom ruling. And at 1798, the Pope was taken captive. Well, I believe that this courtroom ruling and this are the same event. So the heavenly event is linked to the earthly event. So this is when seal number one was opened. There were other things that occurred in that meeting and that courtroom meeting by the way is still going on. It has not been uh, gone into recess. But in 1798, the Pope was taken captive. So I believe, as I mentioned before, Daniel 7 and, and Revelation 5 align. 
And there are these are two different uh, scenes. They're both courtroom scenes, and uh, j primarily they sh align because Jesus was given sovereign power in one of them, and he was also given, he received the book of life in the other one. So in both of these, Jesus was honored. If we read in Revelation 5, let's read this text. It says, I wept and wept. This is John uh, speaking here. Because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll, this is the book of life, or look inside. Goes on, it says, that then one of the elders said to me, do not weep, see, the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is Jesus, the root of David, which is another reference to Jesus, has triumphed at the cross. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Triumphed. He was given a winner's ribbon and a winner's crown. Jesus triumphed at the cross. So the good news here is that in this courtroom uh, meeting, Jesus was found worthy. That's good news for us, isn't it? So this campaign is a, a bit of a controversial one because it conflicts with many religions of the world. Millions of Christians have been led to believe that salvation comes through rituals, good works, sacraments, or church affiliation, and none of these are true. Rituals, good works, sacraments, and church affiliation will not save you. Salvation comes through faith in Jesus only, obediently surrendering our will to the will of Christ. So as a recap, I believe the first seal was broken in 1798. This started a campaign that promotes the salvation of uh, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And I believe the, the prophecy in Revelation 5, 5 where Jesus was found worthy and in Daniel where he was given sovereign authority tied to the same meeting in heaven. Okay, let's take a look at the second seal. Second seal has to do with a rider on a red horse. It says when the lamb, Jesus, opened the second seal, another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people slay each other. To him, the writer, was given a large sword, which I'll show you is the Bible. So this rider on this second horse, this red horse, he has a large sword with him. And this somehow this rider takes peace from the earth. Let's look at both of these. In Ephesians 6, uh, 17 we read it says take the helmet of the salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God the sword of the spirit so here we get a good indication that the sword that he has is the word of God and what is the word of God it's the Bible so with the invention of the printing press the Word of God, the sword, the Bible, spread like wildfire over the earth, compelling people to either accept or reject God. When did the printing press come into being? Well, in the early 1800s, the Holy Spirit began prompting Protestants to establish Bible societies in Europe and the United States. Now, this is just a partial list here, but you can see that, I'll read a few of them here. The British Bible Society, 1804, the Berlin, 1805, the Connecticut Bible Society, 1809, the International Bible Society, uh, 1809, 
uh, the Swedish Bible Society, 1814, the American Bible Society, 1816, etc. So we can see that during the 1800s, the Bible really flourished and was spreading throughout the world. Since 1908, the Gideons International has distributed about 1.7 billion Bibles. The Wycliffe Bible translators have completed more than 700 translations. The Bible now exists in more than 2,572 languages and dialects. 2,572, wow. How could this, this could not have been possible except by the ministry of the Holy Spirit? So all these things happened around 1800. Well, here's another interesting part of that text. It says its writer was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people slay each other. Take peace from the earth and slay each other. Well, the Bible, the sword of the spirit, is interesting. It says, do not, this is um, in Matthew 10, 34, and this is Jesus speaking. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. This is Jesus talking. I have not come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So the word of God does cause conflict in this world. So the, the sword of the truth always brings conflict. When Jesus lived on earth, he made people angry with him by what? by speaking the truth. So Jesus said that the problem is that man loves darkness and they are afraid of the light of truth. Where do we find the light of truth? In the Holy Scriptures. So let's take a look at our little heaven earth the linkage here again. So on the second seal there was a large sword given and in 1800s, the translation and distribution of the Bible took off. So I believe that this linkage here is pretty good. This second seal, the opening of the second seal with its large sword, links, I think, excellent with this distribution of the Bible. So I would put the second seal right here. In the 1800s, the Bible was translated and distributed. First seal, 1798, second seal, the 1800s. So the second seal was broken in the 1800s. That's the sword, the word of God, the Bible. So the relationship between the first two seals is important to notice. The first seal, the Holy Spirit searched for people who were eager to understand the truth about salvation through Christ. What is the true nature and how does he save us? The second seal then, he moves upon these people to share their knowledge by reproducing and distributing the word of God. So you can see now that the first seal and the second seal are focused on various aspects of learning about Jesus. The teaching of Jesus is really transforming in a person's life. Okay. We've looked at the seals one and two. Let's look at number three now. Number three has a rider on a black horse. And when the lamb opened the third seal, 
I heard the third living creature say, Come, I looked, and there was before me a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. So these scales were in the hand of the rider. Well, a balance scale, as you know, is used to measure the weight of an object compared to a standard weight. So God will evaluate, I believe, everyone's deeds. This is both to the dead and the living using a ultra-precise ultra heavenly scale, it has no error in it, to determine the amount of everyone's reward. So God will be using a scale to determine our reward, both the, the dead and the living. In Revelation 22, 12, we read, it says, look, Jesus is coming soon. And what does he bring? My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone both the saved and the lost, I'll give to everyone according to what they have done. So there's going to be various and different amounts of rewards. So he's bringing his reward with me and he's going to give it to everyone. So he has weighed out everyone, everyone's deeds. So the breaking of the third seal carries a message throughout the earth. And I believe the scales indicate that there's going to be what I call a pre-advent judgment of man. And it's already begun. Now, do you remember in uh, uh, Daniel, there's a, uh, uh, the, Belsh the, the feast at Belsh uh, Belshazzar's feast, if you will, where there was a handwriting on the wall. And it says, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting, Daniel 5, 27 here. You've been weighed on the scales. So this concept of God weighing what we do on scales is found in other places in the Bible. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. So there are two books. There's the book of life God wrote before he created us. And then there's the books, which is the faithful record of our deeds. And we are weighed, we are measured by our deeds. We are measured on that scale by our deeds, not on the book of life. Because the book of life is sealed. It's still sealed right now. So the question is, when will the rewards be handed out? When will God hand out his rewards? Well, when Jesus returns, he will reward his saints at his second coming. He says he brings it with him, Revelation 22, 12. I just read that to you. So his saints will get their reward when he comes. And Jesus will also reward the wicked at the great white throne judgment. And that, that's at the end of the thousand years. That's in Revelation 20, verse 11. So the rewards are handed out at two different times. One at his second coming, and one, or number two, at the great white throne judgment. So here in Daniel we read, the court was seated and the books were opened. So these books that God the Father opened were the books of our deeds. Then I saw a, uh, a great white throne judgment. Now this is at the end of the millennium, at the end of the thousand years. This is in Revelation 20, verses 11 and 12. It says here, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. And I saw the dead, great and small. Well, how do you see the dead? God is going to resurrect all the lost dead people from all eternity, and they're all going to be standing at the, uh, before the throne. And the books 
were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, those that are lost, will be judged according to what they have done as recorded in the books. So with this great throne judgment, the books were open, Daniel 7, and the books were also opened at the great white throne judgment here. So we can see three places here where the books are being reviewed by God. So I want to make sure you understand this at this point. We're not saved or lost. Well, I'll put it this way. We are saved or lost solely on one thing, based on our acceptance of God's offer of salvation. That's it. If we look in Titus 3 here, it says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, Jesus saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. So anything good that we do, God wants us to do good things, but anything we do does not add one iota to our salvation. Our salvation is totally because of God's mercy towards us. So, when does God start to examine the books? What is this date that he starts to examine the books? 1844 is the date that I have chosen. Where did I get this? Well, I get this from Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. In the 8th chapter of Daniel is recorded the longest prophecy in the Bible. This is a 2300 year prophecy. The longest prophecy in the Bible, 2,300 years. So, I have not studied this very important 2,300 year prophecy with you yet. You may know about it, you may have studied it on your own, but I have not studied it with you. And, and I will. It's going to take several videos to review all these details. And I'll do that after I go through the Great Tribulation uh, videos here and get these all released. So today, well, all I'm going to do is be able to give you a nutshell overview of it. Just a little brief glimpse at it. So this little nutshell overview is this. During the empire represented by the ram, in this prophecy of Daniel 8, a noble and generous king will come to power. And God will move upon this king's heart to help his people rebuild and restore Jerusalem. King Artaxerxes, a future king in Persia, will issue a decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem in 457 BC and 2300 years later Jesus will open the books in heaven's courtroom. Jesus will begin cleansing heaven's temple in 1844. Now this is very brief, but I just wanted to give you a little flavor of what this prophecy is about. So the third seal was broken in 1844, and Jesus began judging the dead in 1844, and he will judge the living during the Great Tribulation. Uh, did you notice something here? That I just pulled 1844 out of the rabbit hat. Obviously, I didn't give you enough information here to make, uh, I didn't give you enough Bible facts that you can, for you to really review this in detail and how I arrive at this date. So I apologize for that, but it's, it's basically, it's out of today's scope of our, this lesson here. I will cover this with you in the future. As a matter of fact, uh, when I do cover it, I'm going to cover the 2300 days, the 70 week prophecy, the 70th week, earthly and heavenly sanctuary, and where we go when we die, in Christ's ministry in heaven. So th there's a lot of information here that I want to cover with you, and I want to do it in a, a, a systematic way. 
so that you can see where I arrive at all the conclusions that I do. But as far as today, we're going to have to go with, uh, with the analysis that I've shown you. So the third seal shows a pair of scales. And I believe this happened in 1844 based on the prophecy of Daniel 8. So I believe those are linked together. And so this sets up this linkage between the heavenly activity and the earthly activity. By the way, this happened, the third seal opens after the second one. So it has to be further in time than the second one. The second one was 1800. First one was 1798, then 1800. And the third one is 1844. So that sort of fits there also. So these are the three seals, 1700, 98, 1800, and 1844. So as a recap here, Jesus brings his reward with him, and prior to returning, Jesus will weigh every deed, every dead person's deeds. And those of us that are alive, we will be weighed by our, uh, by our deeds in real time on earth. So we notice here that the first three seals are additive in nature. Each campaign builds on the accomplishments of the preceding seal. The first three seals were designed to prepare the world for the horrific events that will occur when the fourth seal is broken. So I want you to remember something. As we study the next four seals of Revelation, the conditions on earth will get very, very rough. It's going to be terrible. But God has a blessing for us. And he puts this blessing right in the book of Revelation. It says, Blessed are the one, is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy in Revelation, and blessed are those who hear it, that's you, and take to heart what is written in here, because the time is near. So God has a blessing for us as we study this topic. So I appreciate you taking the time to look this over today. Here are the Bible texts that we've used. You could pause this and copy these down and, uh, and look at them later if you want to. But I do want to thank you for viewing this video and uh, stay tuned as we get into the Great Tribulation during the next few videos. God bless you.